this week on the Back Table Podcast. So it's all about, like everything else, choosing the right patients, making sure you've got the correct diagnosis. These patients have issues with negative pressure, so it's middle ear fusion, and please make sure they're not patchless. You will be surprised when you start asking about that, how incredibly common it is. It's very common. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Back Table ENT Podcast. We're a podcast that focuses on all things otolaryngology, and we've got a really great show for you today. Thanks for stopping by. Now, a quick word from our sponsor. A Clarent has a proud legacy of shaping the ENT landscape. A Clarent pioneered balloon sinuplasty as a minimally invasive therapy for patients suffering from conic sinusitis. They developed the first device, ERA, specifically designed to treat persistent eustachian tube dysfunction. They spearheaded a new minimally invasive option for nasal airway obstruction with the Relieva Tract Balloon Dilation System. And now, a Clarent has revolutionized ENT navigation technology by integrating artificial intelligence in its Trudy navigation system. Not only are they committed to innovating in the ENT space, they also invest in supporting healthcare professionals with a variety of training resources. A Clarent is focused on delivering solutions that amplify the unique skills of ENT surgeons. Visit them at aclarent.com to learn more. Now, back to the show. I'll be your host today. My name is Ashley Agan. I'm a general ENT, and I have the distinct pleasure of getting to interview Dr. Dennis Poe. Um, he's our guest today. You may recognize him from episode 40, uh, where we talked about eustachian tube disorders. So go back and check that one out if you missed it. He's back today to talk more eustachian tube, specifically in the context of the pediatric patient this time. Welcome to the show, Dr. Poe. Well, Ashley, Dr. Aiken, thank you very, very much. It's a real joy to be back with you. It's a real privilege to be able to speak with all of you today about this topic. And uh, previously, we weren't able to talk about the pediatric indications that we'll discuss today. Yeah. So let me, let me give you a proper introduction for those who don't know you. Dr. Poe is a professor in the Department of Otolaryngology at Harvard Medical School. He specializes in neurotology and skull-based surgery and has worked to develop minimally invasive endoscopic surgical techniques in this field. In 2011, he completed a PhD at the University of Tampere, Finland in pathophysiology and surgical treatment of the eustachian tube. And based on his research work confirming that the cartilaginous eustachian tube is the site of most pathology where it serves as a functional valve, he has developed new diagnostic methods and procedures for eustachian tube disorders. He runs the International Eustachian Tube Study Group and served as the principal investigator for the first multicenter clinical trial of balloon dilation of the eustachian tube. And he provides education to surgeons, physicians, patients, and payers about eustachian tube disorders and treatments, including balloon dilation. Um, so I, I, you know, I see you as you know the the expert, the godfather of your station tube treatment. So I'm, I'm always so um, geeked and excited to get to pick your brain and talk to you. Well, I'm just one of many who's uh, contributed to this, so, but I'm <laughs> happy to try to distill it down and bring it to everybody. <laughs> So get, getting started, we're focusing on the pediatric eustachian tube today. So kind of set the stage about how you think about differences between the adult eustachian tube versus the pediatric eustachian tube, thinking about, you know, anatomy and kind of some of the different pathology you see when you kind of compare and contrast those groups. Well, thank you. First, I should just uh, let folks know that I am a consultant for the Clarent Corporation, and uh, as, a, as a consultant, I'm just paid for my time and expenses. So I have no equity interest in the products and, uh, and no uh, royalties from any of the products. So I'm going to speak to you about my academic experience with this. So yeah, uh, the, so the adult eustachian tube, uh, the current indication for the balloons, and we know the cartilaginous portion, which is the target of our surgery, it's the cartilaginous portion that serves as a functional valve, and that's where the pathology is, and that's true in the children as well. So the surgery is going to be targeted to the cartilaginous portion in an adult. It's about 25 millimeters in length. So that's an important thing to uh, keep in mind because when you're working with your balloon catheter, you want to be aware of the length of the balloon. We don't want these to get up into the bony part of the eustachian tube. 
first of all, most of the pathology is not there. And that's also where the internal carotid lies. So we don't want to get our balloons up into that portion. So we're thinking about 25 millimeters. We looked at the CT scans of uh, o- over the age ranges, pediatric age ranges from uh, under two years old all the way up to, to 18. And it does lengthen. We've been previously taught from uh, Bluestone's work that the eustachian tube is mostly full length by age eight. It actually can continue to grow a little bit farther, but the steepest curve is in that underage group. So the indication for pediatric balloon dilation is going to be eight and above because most of them are going to be close to full adult length. And from the measurements that we took, it was about 25 millimeters. Now, by the time you got to uh, age 15 and above, it was up to maybe 27 millimeters on average. So remember, that's a range, but this is a rough guide. So think about that 25 millimeters. The other important difference between the kids just anatomically is the height from the floor of the eustachian tube up to the orifice of the eustachian tube also uh, gets larger as uh, we age in our development. So younger kids, we've been taught that the eustachian tube uh, orifice is going to be taken up in a flatter angle, and it's very true. So you'll have to be looking a little bit lower in the younger kids. The orifice may be a little lower than you think. So there's a bit of height difference, and that's going to change the angle that you go from the floor of the nose. These balloon catheters travel along the floor, and then you angle up toward the eustachian tube orifice. So it's going to be a flatter angle in some of these kids. And that's a little variable at that 8 to 12 year age. The other big difference is there's a lot more inflammation in the kids. So they've got the adenoid hypertrophy. There's adenoid tissue that sometimes is spilling over onto the torus tubarius. The torus, the tubal tonsil tissue can be very robust, lots of cobblestones. And it can sometimes be hard to find the orifice. So sometimes you have to probe around there to actually figure out where's the anterior pillar, where's the torus tubarius, and then somewhere in between there and amidst all this hypertrophied tissue is a lumen. And it can be very friable in the kids too. So the anatomy is a little a little trickier in the children, so just extra caution. When we think about the main causes of eustachian tube dysfunction in children compared to adults. In adults, I'm thinking chronic allergic rhinitis, chronic rhinosinusitis, reflux. In children, there's also the extra inflammatory exposure with the recurrent viral infections. I think of like the kiddos who go to daycare and are just kind of like sick and snotty all the time. Their anatomy kind of, you know, maybe sets them up for more issues because the eustachian tube hasn't quite matured yet. What else do you think about in that age group? Right. Well, surprisingly, from about age six above, it's the same etiologies that you just mentioned. Allergic disease, reflux, rhinosinusitis, general snottiness, if you need. (laughs) Um, But it's more robust in the kids. Their inflammatory reactions are greater. So when I see a a six-year-older and they're still having trouble with their ears, allergies are most common and there's been good work on that. Uh, David Hurst and others have uh, seen a very high percentage of allergic disease in the kids who have not outgrown the need for tubes. So we do a lot of allergy testing. We do a lot of allergy management and thinking about reflux and, and those other pathologies. Under age six, then you start getting into more of the infectious problems. And particularly age four and under, there may be reflux of pathogens as a cause. So this is where there's got to be a lot of research before we we know that we can uniformly do balloon dilations in the future and those kinds of age ranges. Obviously, we wouldn't want to make refluxing of pathogens worse. Yeah. When you're seeing these patients in your clinic, any particular questions in your kind of history gathering that is different from any other patient that you're seeing, any particular questions that you're asking that are really important to that workup? So are you asking just about the otitis media workup in general? You mean specifically who I'm thinking about ballooning? I think both. Yeah. So for your pediatric patients who are coming in and let's say they've had tubes before and you and we are starting to think about balloon, are there particular questions that you need to ask? Well, uh, one of the first questions, when they've already had a tube, I want to know how well did they do with that tube? Or that, was it getting infected? Was it draining? Did it help? Was their speech getting better? And uh, were there any problems with the tubes? Were they getting occluded? So if you've got a lot of adenoid tissue up against the eustachian tube, that's a good indication for adenoidectomy. 
Uh, so ask about snoring, nasal obstruction, rhinitis. Definitely asking about allergies. Why didn't they outgrow this problem with one round of tubes? Asking about allergies, reflux, upper respiratory infections. I want to know, have they ever been patchless? It's incredibly common. Kids get patchless eustachian tubes far more commonly than, than we realize. And they're sniffing. It gets passed up as their allergies. But they're sniffing to cover it up frequently. And so, you know, they just say they've got a blocked ear. So unless you ask about autophony, hearing, hearing their voice echoing in their ears, hearing their breathing, like Darth Vader's breathing in the ears, all the kids get that. <laughs> uh, you have to ask. And one of the things I've seen in these kids who've had multiple tympanostomy tubes, a tube will treat a patchless eustachian tube, in, in my experience, more effectively than it will treat an adult's patchless eustachian tubes. It'll relieve the symptoms. And so we, we can miss this. These two kids are getting multiple tubes. They fall out and their patchless symptoms come back. So they're sniffing. They're complaining about blocked ears. They can come into your office. They can have negative pressure because they're sniffing. They can even have an effusion because they're sniffing so strongly. And so uh, we just automatically put another tube in, assuming it's obstructive dysfunction, without ever asking about autophony. And some of these patients will get sent to me for a balloon dilation. Uh, and I see this about once a week. It's very common. Patchless eustachian tube in kids is very common. It's not rare at all. We just have been missing it. And, and so you absolutely do, do not want to do a balloon dilation on one of those patients. In that case, if the tubes have worked great for them, fine, put another tube in until the TM starts to fall apart. Then you can do a cartilage tympanoplasty, reinforce it in the future, and that might help their patchless. So we have to be really careful to sort out the patchless patients from the obstructive dysfunction. That's probably the single most important. Chronic allergic rhinitis is the most frequent comorbidity that we see with patchless. So if you've got a kid who's allergic and they're needing more than one tube here, you've got to ask about on top, has your ear popped and all of a sudden you're hearing that voice and breathing echoing in your ears. You will be amazed how common that. So got to ask sort those out, and then decide on treatment. You know, you can do another tube. Wow. I had no idea that pediatric patients were patchless to that extent. <laughs> and, it is and, incredibly common. Wow. And I would imagine, you know, sometimes the adult patients have trouble describing the sensation of patchless. So I would imagine kids also would, you know, unless you're asking about it, would maybe not bring that up or be able to describe that other than just the feeling of their ear being kind of clogged and stuffy and blocked. What is your exam like when you're seeing these patients in clinic? Like with adults, I, like I'll frequently, you know, I'm doing a scope exam so that I can really look at the eustachian tube opening. In kids, are you able to do that in clinic? Are they, most of them letting you put a scope in their nose or is it variable? Yeah, well, it's a little variable, but you know, the eight, eight and older, uh, most of them are fine uh, doing it. Just go with a pediatric scope. You know, these are typically 2.7 millimeter diameter. I flop it in front of their eyes, say, you see, it looks like a piece of spaghetti. Mm -hmm. And they're generally very good with that. So just go in slow. Um, now, not everybody's up for it. If they get a tear in their eye, I'll, I'll quickly not do it and just defer that to the operating room if it comes to that. Yeah. Do you decongest their nose? Like, do you do spray or anything to help with that? Or does... Yeah, I, I do. So we use a combination of the uh, oxymetazolam and the uh, topical lidocaine. So we do a quick spray in each nostril. And I tell them that's the worst of it. Yeah. That's our, <laughs> now that that's over, the rest will be easy. <laughs> Um, and when you're, when you're looking at the eustachian tube, what does that look like? Or you kind of describe how your exam, what your thoughts are when you're kind of looking at that. So uh, once the scope's in the nasopharynx, I'll turn it sideways so I can go back and forth across the vomer. And I'll look at each eustachian tube, have them say, ka, 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 just to move the torus with the action of the levator muscle. And because of the, the, uh, Eustachian tube opens with the action of the two muscles. The levator immediately rotates the torus, sets a stage for the tensor muscle to open the valve. So you got to have both of them working. So the ka, ka, ka moves the levator and then swallows. That's a normal physiological opening. And then saying ah or a, a, a big yawn, that's a maximal sustained dilatory effort. And what I'm looking for is how well does that valve open or not? What's the severity of the pathology in the lumen of the eustachian tube? 
is contact with the torus interfering with opening of the valve. Typically, if it traps the torus when they swallow, you get what's what I call anterior thrusting. The torus gets pushed forward anteriorly and blocks the valve when they're swallowing. Uh, very, very common with adenoid hypertrophy, and particularly in kids. So looking at those points, and then I'm looking at the valve for a patchless defect, because it's so common in the kids, especially if they've got allergic disease. And you can see robust inflammation in the whole nasopharynx, the orifice of the eustachian tube, and even ad, uh, this uh, cobblestone and going down into the lumen, adenoid like tissue in the lumen, and yet in the membranous wall, not the cartilaginous torus wall, but the opposite, anterolateral membranous wall, you can actually see a, a defect in the valve sometimes where it's beginning to get a- atrophic. Chronic allergic disease is associated with patches of atrophy in the nose, sinuses, and you can get it in the valve of the eustachian tube. That's why so many of these patients become patchless. So I'm looking for those things. Inflammation in the lumen, the, the severity, how well does it open or not, patchless defect, and the adenoid. Yeah, it is. I've seen that too, where it, they can have kind of impressive lymphoid hypertrophy and mucus, everything looks super swollen. And then you kind of look right down the barrel of the eustachian tube and then you're like, oh, wait, maybe there is, a, maybe it's, maybe you're patchless. So you really have to look closely. Have you ever had situations where there's so much adenoid tissue that you can't sneak around and look across to the other side because their whole, that whole back nasopharynx is just completely full of adenoids? Absolutely. Uh, pretty common. So great, great patient to uh, do an adenoidectomy. And, and I do a lateral adenoidectomy with endoscopic guidance. I actually nowadays put a 70 degree scope in the mouth instead of a mirror. You get a much better view. So uh, lateral adenoidectomy, I'll even trim tubal tonsil tissue, 15 watts, to just trim some of the, not, not the orifice, but the medial half that faces the, the adenoid. You can trim that with a light 15 watt monopolar suction cautery just to clear all of that inflammatory tissue away from the, the lumen. And then I'll look at the lumen, which previously I wouldn't have been able to see even with endoscopy in the office. If the patient is consented for a balloon dilation, I'll make a decision at that time, looking in the lumen, do I want to balloon this patient or not? Or was that adenoid really the biggest problem? And when you're doing your adenoidectomy, so the classic way you have headlight and a mirror and, you know, a suction bovi or coblator or microdebrider or something that you're kind of taking down that adenoid tissue with. So for you, you're actually using your 70 degree endoscope to look around the corner instead of a mirror so that you can see a lot better, but you're still going through the mouth. Yes. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. Exact same technique, except I'm using the endoscope. And uh, boy, you know, when the residents are doing that, I can see everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, I mean, the an adenoidectomy in the beginning is, can be really challenging, especially if you have a lot of adenoid tissue and being able to see. So, I mean, having a scope makes a lot of sense. What's your instrument of choice to take down adenoid tissue? Do you use a curette or do you suction bovi? The, the suction bovi, unless it's uh, very large, then I'll use the coblator to get the big stuff off. It's just quicker. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So backing up, so other things in the office. So like, for example, let's say you have a patient that you weren't able to scope. Maybe they're very young or they just, you know, weren't going to tolerate that. Do you ever get an x-ray, like a a nasopharynx x-ray to look for adenoid tissue? Is that helpful at all? Or you know you're going to the operating room anyway, so maybe you just do an exam under anesthesia and make some decisions at that time. How do you think about that? Yeah, I've stopped doing the x-rays for just what you said. We're going to the OR any rate, so we're going to do a flexible scope at the beginning of the procedure, take a quick look at the adenoid situation, and decide adenoidectomy or not. So I just do it in the OR. Yeah, because these kids are getting, most of them are going to get like another set of tubes, like plus or minus adenoidectomy, plus or minus balloon. Exactly. Okay. Moving on to treatment options, is there any medical management that you like to try to do a trial of first before you move on. You mentioned allergies. Is it important to say, hey, like we're going to do four to six months of allergy treatment and see if that helps? Just thinking about this out loud, in adults, four to six weeks is not as long of a time frame as, you know, in a six-year-old <laughs> because I think if they're struggling and they have an effusion and they can't hear, the longer we delay treatment, the more I worry about just their hearing. I don't know. How do you think about that? Well, absolutely. I'll follow the clinical practice guidelines from the American Academy. 
So first time around three months, middle refusion or really within the X number of cases, uh, episodes that you've had, you know, six episodes in a year or something like that. So I'll, I'll follow those. However, I will concurrently get them started. If I think they've got allergies, I'll get them concurrently started on that. And we might recheck them before they get to the operating room. If they clear up, you know, great, we cancel the case. But no, I completely agree with you. Let's not delay it. If they've been getting speech delays or, or you know, repeated infections, go ahead and let's get them uh, booked and we can always cancel if they're getting better. Yeah. And, and with allergy management in children, a lot of it is still the same, correct? Like nasal sprays are still effective over the counter antihistamines. You might do allergy testing and immunotherapy. Right. So immunotherapy, of course, is a long-term thing. We, we do send them out for a lot of allergy testing, but that, that all takes a long time. And, you know, the majority come back all negative on the tests. We have to remind them that doesn't mean you don't have an allergy. <laughs> we, there are lots of false negatives. And in which case we're treating generically, just like you said, antihistamines and uh, nasal steroid sprays and occasional uh, zelestine antihistamine nasal spray. And for tubes, tubes work great. I think they're basically kind of creating a shortcut so that if the eustachian tube is edematous and swollen and not working, then you have a kind of a shortcut for the middle ear to aerate is kind of how I talk about it with patients. So it works really well, but it's not actually addressing the underlying issue. At what point, you know, if patients are like, let's just keep putting in tubes, like at some point do you say like, maybe we need to think about balloon dilation. I mean, a lot of times with the second or third tube, you think about the adenoidectomy, but is there a certain amount of tubes where you would say, okay, we've reached our limit, we can't put in tubes anymore? Or do you think about T-tubes at a certain point? Totally agree. So so generally, first time around, kids are going to get a tube. If you've got a frequent swimmer, you know, who's on a swim team or something, they don't really want a tube. But most of the times you're going to get a tube up front first. And uh, tube worked, everything was good. But it didn't do the job. As you said, it's just treating the symptom. It's not treating the, the source, the underlying etiology. So when you come time to explain, well, well, now we have to do something again, uh, you, you could place another tube or the balloon is an option. So for the exact same indications, I think they're, they're equally good options from that point of view, equally indicated, I should say. The, the balloon obviously is treating the source. Hopefully, and we've got a couple of studies that have been showing this, that if you do a balloon, your, your chances of needing further tubes actually is significantly reduced. So that's, uh, that's one thing to consider is because you're treating the source, you're, you may be reducing the chance of needing further tubes. So if I see a child who's had multiple tubes, first of all, I've got to make sure they weren't patchless. Once we've ruled that out, then yes, then I, I will favor a balloon over multiple tubes. Right. Absolutely. And with multiple tubes, as you know, the tympanic memory can eventually start to break down. And then you're dealing with a, a thin portion. It might turn into a pocket in the future or they get perforations. The risk of a permanent perforation is going up each time you put in a, yet another tube. And I try to avoid the T-tubes. So a primary tube, you put in a primary short-term tube, that's about a 2% incidence of a permanent perforation. And that goes up each time you put in more tubes. A T-tube, a longer duration tubes, 16% uh, risk of a permanent hole. It's a big difference. Yeah, I think we've all had that patient where we put in a T-tube and then you see them in follow-up and the, the T-tube is just sitting in a perf and you're just like, oh, it's, it's really frustrating. So you could start thinking about a balloon dilation even with the second set of tubes. Well, sure. Our studies, we've all looked at patient, well, I've tried to look at patients who had two or more tubes. Most of them you know, had, had quite a number and previous adenoidectomy. So we were looking at worst case scenario types to see what the balloon would do in the research versus continuing to place more tubes. So in general, yeah, once they're looking at yet another tube, a balloon's a really great option. Mm -hmm. That's been most common indication in my practice. I think the a majority of these indications are probably going to be, yes, they got a tube, tube worked. Now we're facing yet another tube indication. The balloon might might be a better option. Now that may change in the future, you know, as research goes on, maybe we can get away from tubes. That is actually a goal. Yeah, that's really interesting. So with that, we're talking about kids who are basically older than eight. So the indication's eight and above. Eight and above. So back to our balloon dilation patient, we've talked about patients who 
who might also benefit from having adenoidectomy because they have a lot of um, that inflammatory response and adenoid tissue in the back of the nose. So you would combine adenoidectomy maybe plus balloon if you're getting there and you're kind of seeing that there's some inflammation within the lumen of the eustachian tube as well. Is that kind of a decision you make intraoperatively if you aren't able to get that exam beforehand? Exactly. So if it looks like the adenoid is pretty robust and it's significantly impacting onto the uh, torus and maybe even spilling over onto the torus, sure, we'll trim that back, uh, at least with a lateral adenoidectomy. And I do a lot of revision adenoidectomies because the lateral portion is not always taken out the first time around. So adenoidectomy is a common part of taking a kid back to the OR for either tubes or a balloon. That's frequently a part of it. Now, again, uh, we're not going to trim adenoid-like tissue going down the lumen of the eustachian tube. If, if, you re- if you think that's the problem, that's what the balloon does. The balloon, histologically, we've seen from uh, specimens in, in patients, it's basically doing an adenoidectomy on that adenoid-like tissue that's gotten down the lumen. So it crushes that tissue and it grows back very healthy. So think of the balloon as your tool for addressing intraluminal disease. Exactly. It's just extending your reach of doing an adenoidectomy on adenoid-like tissue that's gotten down the lumen. Yeah. And when you're addressing, let's say, like the lymphoid hypertrophy of that posterior cushion on that medial aspect outside of the lumen, are you doing that through the nose? Are you looking through the nose with a scope or do you also do that through the mouth? Uh, you're talking about trimming the tubal tonsil tissue? Yeah. Yeah. No, I do that. I've still got that 70-degree scope in the mouth, so I'm typically doing that. I, I was doing it through the nose with an endoscope for a while, but um, you just don't need to. You know, the view's quite good with that 70-degree scope. And going through the nose, you know, if you get any bleeding, it runs right over your eustachian tube. Yeah. So you're staying medially and you're kind of addressing all of that lymphoid hypertrophy and kind of tonsil tissue that is me- on the medial aspect of that posterior cushion. And you're not creeping it into the lumen because you're going to use your balloon to treat the lumen. Exactly. We don't want the cautery in the lumen. You know, that could cause unpredictable injury, scar. Yeah, That's right. Okay. That makes sense. And for kids who may have, you know, maybe they do have a little bit of adenoid tissue, but on your exam, it appears that the main issue is the lumen, inflammation within the lumen of the eustachian tube. Do you ever just say like, we're just going to do a eustachian tube dilation? It, I don't think we really need to treat the adenoid tissue. Um, it's, it's there, but it's minimal. Absolutely. Yeah. As a surgeon, you're, you're going to target the disease that you see. Yeah. So uh, wh- whatever's relevant. Right. Okay. And then kind of working through our patients, we talked about the patient who's got, you know, a lot of adenoids and inflammation in the back of the nose. What about, you know, every now and then I'll have patients who have had, they've had a cholesteatoma, they had a cartilage graft and panoplasty, um, and now they've got some fluid behind that cartilage graph or they've got maybe like some retraction or they're basically they're symptomatic in their ear that's been operated on and they don't have recurrent cholesteatoma. Have you used the balloon very much in those patients and does that help? Sure. That's a, a really good indication. They you, you closed their perforation or took out their cholesteatoma and now they're getting middle ear effusion. That's a great indication for the balloon rather than putting a tube right through your freshly healed tympanoplasty. And we do a fair number of balloons at the time of doing tympanoplasty. So if it looks like the eustachian tube is still compromised and I might scope them at the time of the surgery, sure, you can do a balloon at the same time. Do the balloon first if you're going to do that, and then do your tympanoplasty just so if there's any back pressure from blowing up the balloon, it doesn't mess up with your graph. <laughs> so we, we do a fair amount of that. Yeah, I would I would imagine that that you're doing that a lot more than you used to as far as just doing it at the same time and kind of treating that underlying issue, you know, all kind of all together. Right. The only tricky part about that is, especially if you use a cartilage graph, you're not going to get that type A tympanogram maybe to be able to kind of see the improvement. But if the fluid is gone, then, you know, you've you've fixed the problem, right? So. Yeah. So you don't get the satisfying type A, but if you you insufflate them and you see the uh, non-cartilaginous part of the drum moving freely, that feels pretty good. Yeah, yeah. You'll, t- you'll take it, right? Right. Um, let's see here. Most of these procedures you're doing in the operating room, correct? I, I am, yes. So, uh, you know, particularly with kids, that would be really tough in the office. Yeah. Adults you can do in the office pretty readily with the right patients. Mm-hmm. And, and many, many people are doing that very successfully. And um, looking at your outcomes, 
So you're, ho- you know, hoping to have normalization of that tympanogram, you know, moving from either a type C or B to a type A. And do you also measure, you know, a patient's ability to perform Valsalva or modified Valsalva? Is that, you know, one of your outcome measures as well? Yes, it is. So all the kids we take to, uh, even when I see them in the office and I'm just evaluating them right from the beginning, I try to teach all of them a modified Valsalva. So not holding your nose and blowing hard because if people have blown out and destroyed their sensory neural hearing and gotten vertigo from that. So a modified Valsalva, nose and mouth closed, gently blown, only gently. So there's just a little positive pressure and they swallow hard at the same time. So that's a little tricky. Not everybody can do it. But you'll be surprised how many kids can do that. So I try to teach all of them to do it. So that's actually a really a, a really important part of the exam to see if they can do that modified valsalva. If they can do it, they don't need the balloon usually. Now, if, they, if they're just too young to coordinate that or they just can't get it, uh, then we have them do these uh, otovent balloons, okay. which are actually pretty good. And, and there's some uh, that, that's actually recommended in the CPGs as well. Uh, or that Eustachy device, uh, the a little air pump that goes up to your nose. They can work too, but the, the younger kids are kind of scared of that one. But they do really well with that nasal balloon. Okay. And are you looking at the eardrum while they're doing that modified Valsalva just to look to see if the eardrum lateralizes? Or do you just ask them like if they feel that change in their ear? Yeah, I generally just ask, do you feel a change? And if they say, yes, I felt the change, my ear pop, then I'll quickly look again to see if there's a difference. Okay, great. So in, any other outcomes that you're looking for? Tympanograms, ability to Valsalva or modified Valsalva? Yeah, the, the clinical exam, ability to insufflate it, the audiogram as well. I uh, want to see their conductive hearing loss has gotten better and that modified Valsalva. So all, all of those, yes. Okay. And any absolute contraindications? When I mean, you talked about the, the balloon is going to prevent, based on the way it's designed, it's going to prevent you from getting up into the middle ear. If any contraindications for a balloon other than patchless, I guess, that would be the big yeah, one. Yeah, that is the big one. Not really, you know, unless they've had some kind of anatomical problem. Uh, I, you know, I, I've seen a few cases where the station to orifice has been completely obliterated from past scar or something, previous surgery, turbinectomy, adenoidectomy. So you, you, if they don't have an orifice, you're not going to successfully balloon them. And if you can see that in the office with an endoscopy earlier, you can spare them going to the operating room and having a failed attempt at a balloon. And then relative contraindications, of course, you want to try to have any active disease like allergies under control, reflux under control. And we're not routinely doing syndromic kids, so they've got anatomical issues that the balloon may not be able to treat. So that's still a research area. Uh, I have had some success in older kids, uh, teens and adults, young adults, with cleft who've been repaired well, their levator muscle is not blocking the eustachian tube, and they've got a fair burden of inflammation, which I think I can treat. So very selected cleft patients, I have had success. I've only done a a very few Downs patients and they were not successful. Yeah, I think going back to what you mentioned, if we think about just the balloon is a device to treat inflammation within the lumen of the eustachian tube, you know, if patients have a problem that's related to a craniofacial abnormality and not inflammation, then it's maybe less likely to work. So looking for that inflammation sounds like that's key. Exactly. That's really... Uh, what you're going to be treating as a surgeon. Yeah. And when you're performing the procedure, is it pretty much the same as when you're doing it in adults? Any, you know, are you doing it through the nose? Do you need to go transoral? Is the device different or it's the same same device? So the device is the same. And again, you know, much of the anatomy is already fully developed in the eight-year-old, although the uh, angle might that the orifice might become a little bit higher in the small eight-year-olds with time. So the clarin balloon has a a guide catheter and the flexible balloon goes through the guide. Yeah. Would you say that that's the biggest difference with kids is just being able to find the lumen of the eustachian tube because of all that inflammation? The answer is yes. Let me me repeat (laughs) that. (laughs) Yes, it can be tough to find the orifice sometimes because of all this robust inflammation. And you gently, very gently, just touch it to try to move the tissues around to see if you can find the lumen. And, it, and it's so friable, it can just bleed. So yeah, you, you, you uh, just have to be a little patient with it in the kids. The moral is go slow with, with the whole procedure. Just go a little slow 
and uh, you, you'll find the lumen and, and don't push it. Yeah, that, that bleeding really helps you find the lumen then, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it can block it pretty well. <laughs> okay. And then how do you decide how long to inflate the balloon? Great question. Does everybody get two minutes? <laughs> no. So again, it, the duration of the balloon is commensurate with how severe is the inflammation. That's true in the adults. So two minutes is the max. But you know, if you've got like a patient who's got minimal inflammation, I'll, I'll do typically like one minute. Sometimes I do a minute and a half. Now, 18 and below, I never go above a minute and a half anymore because we started getting some patchless kids. Uh, they are more sensitive to the effect of the balloon than the uh, adults. So uh, need, need research on this, but there's no question they are more sensitive. They have more inflammation, but it's more sensitive to the effect of the balloon. So uh, uh, fortunately, I've never had to fix the patchless symptoms that we got. You know, they, they were self-limited, but uh, it got my attention. So I never go beyond a minute and a half in pediatrics, and we've not had any problems since. Okay. And, and so if you did, let's say you under dilated, let's say like you were concerned, so you only did a minute and a patient comes back and it seems like they didn't have the improvement that you were hoping. Do you ever, you know, go back and say, okay, maybe we'll do that minute and a half or how often does that happen? Not very often. Uh, so the balloon's usually very successful, but uh, the, the more common in the, uh, issue would be you did the balloon and they and they got better for a period of time, but now they're having trouble again, or they had a bad cold and their effusion is back. The most common scenario is that they, they have allergic disease or reflux disease, and they didn't keep it under appropriate control, environmental or diet or, what, or medications. So they were doing great. They, they slipped on their chronic medical management. Uh, they're, they're failing again. You get them back on their medical management, it's not getting them over the hump. Okay, we'll bite the bullet and, and we could do a repeat dilation in those patients. If it doesn't work up front, I usually am not going to do another balloon. There may be a problem you know, higher up. It could be in the bony eustachian tube. So I'm not typically going to repeat it. Um, now, the scenario you mentioned where, okay, that, that would be unusual, but okay, so they got a borderline improvement, almost there. And maybe I only gave them one minute. I might, I'm, you know, if I, if I look, you know, they'll let me look and I see, yeah, there's some inflammation I just didn't get. But let's go back and do yet, uh, you know, maybe another minute. You, you could justify that. So I'll leave it up to the surgeons in that kind of scenario. That, that hasn't come up often. Can you talk about other risks and complications that, that you've seen and how to avoid them? Yeah, there was actually a uh, paper that just came out recently looking at the MAUD, M-A-U-D-E. This, this is the self-reported uh, complications to the FDA with these devices. And uh, the most common on that was subcutaneous emphysema. That is a laceration or false, false uh, passage through the membranous wall. The membranous wall is only a few cells thick. And, and again, Surgeons can penetrate that, and in our labs or clinically, when it's happened, no one has ever felt it. It's so thin. So the only way to avoid that is to have a direct view down the lumen of the eustachian tube. And this is why I, I always recommend that you've got to be able to see both walls. You know, with your clinical exam, you want to see both walls of the valve, not just one. It would be look, like looking at the vocal cords. And, you know, if you don't see the valve at all, it's equivalent to looking at the epiglottis and you don't even see the vocal cords, but you're going to operate on the vocal cords, you, you wouldn't do it. And in this case, you know, if you use a zero degree scope and you, and you don't uh, get an angled view and all you're seeing is the torus, you're, you're seeing, you know, maybe one wall of the valve. It's like seeing one vocal cord and you're going to operate on both. So you want to see both walls, evaluate both walls, and you want to see both walls when you're putting the balloon up there you wind up, as you run the balloon up, you hug the membranous wall. You're running tangential to it, so you're not going to penetrate it. But what commonly happens is the surgeons are confident. I can see everything I need to with a zero degree. They don't see the membranous wall, but they say, well, I've got the torus there. If you angle off of the torus, it actually takes you through the membranous wall. That's how it happens. And in fact, there was a carotid injury, which I'm sad to say. And this was in one of the rail-based devices where there's a bendable rail and the balloon slides up on that. So you, you put the rail up into the lumen and you slide the balloon up there to do your balloon dilation. 
and uh, it didn't discuss it in the article, but I, I, we, we've duplicated this in the lab, you know, years ago. We knew this could happen with anything rigid. That's why we don't put rigid things in the eustachian tube. So if, if you angle off the torus, what probably happened in that case was the rail went right through the membranous wall. That takes you in a, in a vector straight toward the carotid. So in the article, they talked about the bony portion of the eustachian tube where the carotid is in proximity. That's probably not where this injury happened. It was a, a stroke a week after the balloon. So there was a, a intimal injury and a pseudoaneurysm. So they probably poked the carotid with this uh, rail. Uh, and undoubtedly, that's a membranous wall injury. So the, the balloon has safety devices for all of this. It's got a soft, round, two millimeter diameter tip that if you don't push it in fast, and you can, and you watch it go up the membranous wall. Now, the, the, uh, eustachian tube curves initially, medially, and actually dives behind the adenoid a little bit, and then it curves off toward the ear. And a lot of surgeons don't realize that because they haven't looked up that far. So the balloon is flexible for just that reason. So it's going to navigate that turn and, and it's got that ball tip so that it'll push the mucosa aside as you get up out of sight. So as a surgeon, you're going to set it along the membranous wall, tangential to it, so you won't penetrate it. And then as it disappears out of sight, it's going to just curve around. The cartilage becomes increasingly circumferential, and so it'll just guide along there. Uh, so the other safety features are the... Uh, so so you're normally going to feel the isthmus when that ball tip contacts it, and there's a little mark at 31 millimeters. This yellow mark should never disappear into the lumen because you know the a average eustachian tube cartilaginous length is 25 millimeters, so it should normally be sticking out about a half a centimeter from the orifice. And in the smaller kids, maybe stick out even more than that, you know, maybe up to a centimeter in the smallest eight-year-olds. So you want to see that that yellow mark is nowhere, not going to go into the orifice. You're going to feel that little uh, ball tip touch the isthmus. And so that that's how how you can do it. So you, you insert it under direct view. Typically, you need an angle of the endoscope, not necessarily. If you can see both walls, you're fine. If you can see both walls with a zero degree, you're fine. But if you can't, get out the angled scope. So that's how you avoid this uh, problem of, uh, of air emphysema. There's actually been reported cases of pneumomediastinum. This happens from the patient getting a false passage, didn't get recognized, and the patient blew their nose within the first week. So we always recommend don't blow your nose in the first week. No modified valsalvas in the first week. Fortunately, no complications came of those. They all were self-limited. Some of them needed, uh, some of them got antibiotics, but uh, not all of them did. And uh, and there haven't been any any other significant a adverse complications. You know, there have uh, there have been some reports of tinnitus and sensory neural hearing loss in. Uh, devices uh, outside of the U.S. I, I'm not aware. Of, I'm sorry. There was one case of tinnitus in the MOD report. That's the only one I know of reported with a U.S. device, FDA. De uh, well, actually, we've got several approved devices now in the States. But of the uh, uh, reports that I'm uh, uh, familiar with, uh, th that's the only case of tinnitus I've seen in, the, in a U.S. Uh, product. Okay. And so you mentioned the in a kid, you might tolerate the balloon kind of sticking out more than you're used to seeing in an adult. Yeah, so if you run into that stop uh, of the uh, isthmus, you feel it, uh, and it's sticking out more than you're used to with the adults, that's okay. And with your post-op instructions, other than not blowing their nose or, or doing a, a modified Valsalva in the first week, any other instructions that you give them? You know, in my experience with adults, there's not a ton of post-operative pain to treat. I mean, if they're, if they're getting an adenoidectomy, you know, they're going to probably need some some Tylenol Motrin. Um, but any other post-op instructions that are specifically related to the balloon portion? Not really. It's extremely well tolerated. I, I warn the parents they're going to complain more of a sore throat from their endotracheal intubation than they'll complain about their ear uh, or, or the back of their nose. So it it's it's very very well tolerated. Uh, you know, if they have any soreness in the nasopharynx or ear, it's really temporary, a day or two. You know, we talk about keeping the nose humidified if uh, if needed for comfort measures. But I uh, know it, it's really the uh, modified valsalva nose blow that's the main post op instruction. Oh, and then after uh, older kids, adults, after a week, I do encourage them to do the modified valsalva. Let's get that air, ear aerated 
as quickly as possible. The swelling from the balloon is going to decrease over about four to six weeks after the procedure. So we, you do want to try to get that eustachian tube aerated. So we wait a week, and then I start having them do their otovent balloon or, or, or the uh, modified valsalvas if they can coordinate that. And you tell them it could take you four to six weeks to notice a difference? That's right, yeah. So I'll uh, encourage them, you know, wait, wait a little bit of time before you jump on an airplane, for instance, if you've been barrow challenged. Yeah. Okay. And then for kids, they've got a lot, they've got a lot of life to live, right? <laughs> so is this expected, you know, should we be able to do a dilation when they are eight years old and expect that this should last, you know, for the rest of their life as long as if we're assuming that other factors are controlled for. So if they, you know, stay on top of their allergies or reflux or whatever else is going on. Absolutely. You know, think of it as adenoidectomy in the eustachian tube. You don't normally have to repeat an adenoidectomy. Occasionally it happens. Most, re- most common indication for repeat adenoidectomy is allergic disease. They didn't keep it under control. So you generally are not going to need to do a repeat dilation. Yeah. So this is just another tool, just another tool in our toolbox, right? Absolutely. Uh, we've just got a technology which turns out to be very effective on treating adenoid-like disease inside the uh, eustachian tube. Awesome. So as, as we round things out, in summary, balloon dilation is, is an effective additional tool to treat inflammation in the lumen of the eustachian tube and can be used safely in kids as young as eight years old, correct? Correct. What else? <laughs> well, it's, it's indicated down to age eight. And so it's all about, like everything else, choosing the right patients, making sure uh, that you, you've got the correct diagnosis. These patients have issues with negative pressure. So it's middle ear fusion. So picking the right patient, that it's a wonderful addition to our being able to treat a very common problem. And it gets to the source of the problem. So the rate of needing further treatments uh, in our studies was very significantly reduced compared to just the natural history of repeated tubes. Repeated tubes don't treat the problem. Fantastic. All right. And, and the FDA approval or FDA indication for using this in kids, this is an, a new development. Is that right? That's right. Because it used to be off-label. That's right. It's just recently been approved. Yeah, which, which, and usually that means that once FDA approval is going to lead to hopefully um, insurers covering it and this being a tool that we can kind of offer to our pediatric patients now. Well, that's right. So we already have CPT codes for this, for unilateral and, dila- uh, and bilateral uh, balloon in, uh, dilation. So what's new is the pediatric indication. And yes, it's going to take some time for the payers to accept that. Uh, they'll have to change their payer approval processes, and that's they're, they're usually on a one-year cycle. So there will be a delay, and I'm sorry to everybody, <laughs> but, there, but there always is a delay with yep. some new indication. But uh, be patient; it will happen. Yeah, and and it's 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 exciting for patients too to have another option. You know that that really kind of gets at the source of the where the inflammation is happening. So uh, it's exciting. Yeah, to be able to treat the source, and you know, again, I, I look forward to the day when we don't usually have to do tubes. We may resort to these other other techniques to treat the problem right up in the beginning. Yeah. Wouldn't that be fascinating when we talk about, or, you know, back in the day, we used to put tubes in. And <laughs> um, yeah, that's that's amazing. Well, this has been a pleasure. Thank you so much for coming on. It's, it's always just such a joy to speak to you and get to kind of pick your brain about all of this. So I, I really appreciate it. And any final words or parting words for our listeners before I let you go? Well, thank you. It's been a real joy to be able to talk with all of you. And uh, Ashley, it's, it's great to, uh, to be on your show again. So I really appreciate the opportunity. So yeah, I think this is the dawn of a, of a really exciting era in better ways of, of treating otitis media, one of the most common problems that we deal with in our practices and globally. So uh, uh, really excited to be at the beginning of, uh, of a new era here. So pick your right patients and, uh, and, and review all those safety features of your device and how to use them properly. So good luck to all of you. Thank you. Awesome. Fantastic. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at underscore Backtable ENT on Instagram, LinkedIn, or Twitter. 
Backtable ENT is hosted by Gopi Shaw and Ashley Agan. Our audio team is led by Kieran Gannon with support from Josh McWhorter, Aaron Bowles, Nick Shellcross, and Ness Smith Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz with support from Taylor's Version Hess and Yvonne Orvijinsky. Social media and PR by Chi Ding. Administrative support provided by Jamila Kinnebrew. Thanks again for listening and see you next week.